Inflation is a terrible thing. Inflation you could tolerate. You could trade anything as a trend fall. When you think about Bitcoin, I don't think it's a currency. I think it's a commodity. Today, we're in an everything bubble. I'm Eric Schatzker, and welcome to Bloomberg's Front Row. Today, I'm talking to Gene Hines, the CEO of Wellington Management. Boston-based Wellington is one of the world's largest asset managers, with almost $1.3 trillion of investments. But because it's a private partnership, the firm has been shrouded in mystery. Jean is changing that. She's also making ESG investing one of Wellington's top priorities. She says sustainability will transform the structure of financial markets. We don't think it's woke. We think it's part of, like a very, very important part of studying the opportunity set and the risk set of, of 5,000 companies. Is that to say there's alpha in ESG or alpha in sustainability? Abs yeah, absolutely. You believe that? I believe that. Gene and I explore the strategies and perspectives that make Wellington different and are defining her tenure as CEO. Why she still believes in globalization and having a presence in China. The virtues and challenges of active management. What to expect from Wellington's expansion into alternatives. The value of staying private. Here's my conversation with Gene Hines. Gene, Wellington is one of the world's largest investment firms, but relative to BlackRock, PIMCO, Fidelity, Vanguard, I could name others, of yes. course, it's hardly known and certainly not well understood. Yeah. Why? For a long history, um, we have had a very low public profile, so that that would be number one. I would say another reason is that we are a sub-advisor, so our largest business, um, one of our largest businesses is to be a sub-advisor to other companies that are well-known household names, such as Vanguard and Fidelity and T. Rowe Price, for example. So we, would, we, don't, we don't market directly to consumers. Um, we are the content provider. Um, so you combine those two that we're not, we're not actually we're not a household name, brand name, but and also at the same time, we had a very low public profile um, is probably the reason most people don't know us. Is having a low public profile, flying under the radar, if you like, being a little mysterious, good for business, a competitive advantage? It probably served us well over time. I think for our current, if, if you look at in 2022, why am I talking to you today? <laughs> um, I think the main reason is because we're a sub-advisor and we rely on partners, we're finding that it is important that, um, that our brand is known for our content. I think um, very importantly, and maybe even more importantly, I also think it helps with talent. So it's very interesting that you know, for years and years and years, we would be, um, we would try to have attract talent, and no one would ever know anything about us. And, and that served us. That was fine when we were a Boston-based company. But when we began to globalize and, and um, begin to hire investors all over the world, that didn't serve us well. That's been a big change, hasn't it, in the asset management industry? The importance of having a brand. Yes. I want to give people a sense of the scale of your business. Yeah. So let's start with assets under management. What are they now? So assets under management are um, a little bit over $1.2 trillion. Another thing that's maybe a little bit different about us is that we're very balanced between equities and fixed income. And we're, how many employees? We, uh, we have about a little over 3,000 employees. We're growing, we're investing in our business. That is likely to be closer to 3,500 in a year or two oh as my. we invest in a number of businesses. And we're also global, so 30% of our employees are, are in our Europe or Asia offices. Of those 3,000 employees, how many are involved in investment management? Yeah, so I would say about 900 are involved in investment management and 600 are involved in sort of the, it, the direct investment process. So portfolio managers, research analysts, quantitative analysts, fixed income investors, all of the, that would be about 600 people. Okay, 900 investment professionals. Yes. If I'm not mistaken, you're talking about growing some more, but that's already up some 40% over the last five years. If I take you a step back, if when I started at Wellington in 1991, I've uh, been here for almost 31 years, we were known as a U.S. value shop, U.S. value equity shop. We ran um, the, the number of big um, Vanguard value funds, 
So the biggest change over each of those decades that I've been here is um, in the 1990s, we added growth equities, we added small cap and mid cap. The big change in the 2000s was really investing in our, our, our fixed income business and globalizing, so adding global strategies. Um, and, the, and then the biggest change in the last, say, five or this decade has really been adding um, more alternative capabilities, privates and um, longshore capabilities. How does the firm evolve next? So that is my job, right? <laughs> if you ask me, when I'm finished my CEO tenure, will I be successful? It will be by figuring out how to help us evolve. How do we make sure we have sort of this robust process to, to help our clients and figure out what our clients need? And also how do we, how do we generate that bottom-up innovation um, so that we can um, continue to develop new products. I'll tell you what we're doing now. So yes, what we're yeah, doing, I'd love to know. Yeah, I mean, so. what are some of the things that you've already started? <laughs> so growing our, our ability to service um, the wealth channel globally. Um, that is an area that we're um, spending time on, and we're going to interact with private banks, for example, that will sell our content. There's a lot of investment. You'd be surprised how much investment. We have to have funds. We have to have funds in different languages. The other investment areas that we're focused on would be sustainability, and that's sustainability across all of Wellington, as well as the private's business and our liquid alts, long short business. The view on sustainability is that it will the sustainability will change the structure of financial markets. Um, and the reason um, we are a believer in that is that um, there is this move um, around the world. Um, the, it's being driven by a real focus on um, governance, social issues, as well as environmental issues. The environmental aspect of it is being driven by governments around the world. That is being driven as governments try to address their pledges from the Paris Accord. Um, there have been rule changes in the financial markets. And that means that the world is um, decarbonizing and the financial markets are a player in that or, 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 or the financial markets are, um, will be a driver, a potential driver of the decarbonization. So that's an area, and that, that encompasses how do, how do we get our 65 teams to integrate ESG into their philosophy and process? And so that's an area we've been spending a significant amount of resources, and, and those resources would be ESG analysts around the globe by sector. We want them very, very much integrated with our research equity and credit research teams. It means um, an, an area that we believe we're leaders in is climate research. How is the world decarbonizing? How is it decarbonizing by sector? How is it decarbonizing by company? I think it's going to be a fascinating process over um, the next decade, and it, and it will have implications for the financial market. Do you think it changes the investment business? If you go back 20 years um, and you were a micro and fundamental investor like myself, I'm a, a micro fundamental healthcare investor, what you needed to do to be successful is you know, know the revenues and the earnings profile of companies and evaluate what the valuation was. And you did that by studying products. I think there was a big shift post the global financial crisis, where as micro fundamental investors, you also needed to worry more about market structure. And 10 years ago, that market structure was, um, what are factors? Mm -hmm. What are ETFs? How are they impacting your industry structures and industry money flows? So you had to add that on to your process of portfolio construction. Decompo decomposition of your returns. Decomposition of your returns, where, how is money flows impacting the valuations of these micro companies? Um, so I think the same is going to happen with, with sustainability and ESG in the sense that you are going to need to know the factors, the sustainability factors that impact each company. And, and my observation is that that is much more complex than understanding factors, whether it's value or growth. You're talking about every industry has different materiality factors. Each company will be going through some, some companies um, decarbonization is more important than social, or other companies' social may be more important. So it will change the markets, but that's where you, like an intense research process, should help, really help. Most of the asset management industry has made a bet yeah. on sustainability. Yeah. But suddenly, ESG is, is under attack, right? There are state governments yeah. here in the U.S. that are 
waging war on sustainable finance. They, they, they're calling it wokeism. What do you think of that? We're not investing on sustainability from a value-based perspective. We're investing in our capabilities from a um, how do we research companies? How are these companies' earnings going to, what are the risks to the companies from ESG factors? What are the opportunities for companies from an ESG factor? So we don't think it's woke. We think it's part of, like a very, very important part of studying the opportunity set and the risk set of, of 5,000 companies. Is that to say there's alpha in ESG or alpha in sustainability? Abs yeah, absolutely. You believe that? I believe that. The alpha will all be in the nuance of company research. Um, you know, what, you know, which companies in, 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 in the life science tools industry, for example, are going to create products to help biologic manufacturing be less emitting. You're only going to be able to figure that out by meeting with 20,000 companies like we do every year. So the, the antithesis, if you will, of like building a momentum model and backtesting it. The antithesis of what the factors were in the last decade. Well, given the importance that you see for sustainability yeah. in the investment process and in performance, yeah. are you concerned that, that sustainability as a concept and ESG as a label are getting so politicized? You know, for the vast majority of our clients, um, ESG um, is very important. It's we, what they want. They're asking a lot of questions. They're asking a lot of questions how we're incorporating it. Now, I think there are some clients in some states that we will also need to pay attention to. I think one of, one of, the, one of the things that's important about our approach is that it's not concessionary. It's going to be based on the company fundamentals. It's not exclusionary. Um, and we believe all sectors of the economy will be, will be, will, could, could have opportunities or could have risks. So we're not excluding sectors. Okay, and th so that I understand it, there's no, at the moment anyway, you don't see this building backlash as a reason to either reverse course or step no, off the gas. No, we're investing very heavily. When you say, Gene, that Wellington is investing heavily and will continue to invest yeah. heavily in, in sustainability across the firm, can we, can we quantify that somehow? Is there a budget that you have for it? Is there some sort of... We have about 75 dedicated, of the 3,000, 75 um, of our employees are, are dedicated to sustainability. So either they're doing ESG research, they're part of our climate team, they're, they're dedicated on our product side. A few years ago, that would have been a few people. We've had, an, we've had an ESG team, a small team, for quite a number of years. We now live in a world of rampant inflation, rising rates, yeah. war, geopolitical tensions with zero-sum outcomes. Very different, right? Very different yeah. from the decade that preceded the pandemic. Yeah. What changes as a result of that for Wellington? I'll go back to 2000 and um, the, the global financial crisis. That was when we started our London expansion. That's when we started our expansion into Asia investment, our investment platform in Asia. And we invested through that period. And that has served us so well. Um, and I think we'll do the same here, that we are going to continue to invest in our capabilities, uh, in our privates expanding in our private capabilities, expanding in our um, long short investing capabilities. It sounds like nothing changes. Nothing, as of now, we have um, a, a great balance sheet that we can invest. The profits of the firm will be down this year, the markets are down, but we will continue to invest um, through this period. Almost every CEO in almost every industry grew up believing that globalization was good. And globalizing has been a priority yeah. of Wellington's for yeah. 15 years. Yeah. Is that still the case? Yes, I would, I would suspect that as at the end of my tenure at Wellington, instead of having 30% of our employees in Europe and Asia, it could be closer to 40% of our employees. So we are deliberately and intentionally um, continuing to invest in our offices around the globe. But you're right that deglobalization is we're in a period of, of regime change and deglobalization. I don't think that necessarily impacts our business and to the extent that um, there is great investment talent all over the globe, um, really great investment talent. We're, we're, we don't have a monopoly. We used to think we had a monopoly of investment talent in Boston, and that clearly wasn't the case. You know, the reason we began to globalize our investment platform is, is that the world was expanding the number of companies 
that were in Europe and Asia. And who are we to say that we're going to follow all of those from our Boston office? That was the reason we began to expand. And I think that is still true, that we are, a, this is a global firm, this is a global economy. And even if, if there are cer certain trends that are deglobalizing, there is still a world there for us to either um, think about from a company perspective or think about from a, um, from, an from an economic perspective. China has become and is still becoming an increasingly complex place in which to do business. How do you manage that? So we have a presence in our Hong Kong office and we have a small presence in our China and in, in China through a Shanghai office. We are expanding our license to be able to invest in in the onshore China. Right now it's small, um, but it's an important place for us to do research. Are you already starting to do anything differently because clients are concerned about inflation, because of the impact on their portfolios of rising rates, because of the potential for yeah. a recession, however long lived it may be? Well, I think our clients have not made major changes. There's definitely more interest in our, our commodities capabilities, our inflation capabilities, our value investing capabilities, which have been out of favor. And, and, and fortunately for, for us, we continue to invest in those teams. Um, but those are probably on the margin more interest than they have had in the past. Wellington is an active manager. No indexing? No. No passives? No. How come? That's not our core skill set. Going back to what is our core skill set, our core skill set is being a research-based company and having these teams of, of um, portfolio managers with different skill sets that practice their philosophy and process. So we're a research-based content company generating insights about the world. That's completely opposite of passive investing. Am I correct in saying that the implicit promise to investors in actively managed products is that they'll either get alpha, right, beat the market, yeah. or better risk-adjusted returns? Yeah, I think for us, that it will, I think you, you, it, it's, clients are asking for both of those, right? <laughs> clients are asking clients for want it both all. <laughs> alpha and um, alpha and risk-adjusted returns. And that's post the global financial crisis. Risk, the pathway of returns has become more important. But you go back to the basics. If you can generate 100 basis points of alpha, 200 basis points of alpha over indices, that is a tremendous compounding effect. The reality, however, is that across the asset management industry, the active yep. investment management industry, alpha is zero or sometimes negative yeah. after fees, and the returns aren't any better on a risk-adjusted yeah. basis. So if that remains the case, what is the future for active management? We need to earn a return. We need to earn, we need to earn that alpha. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, we've created an environment where we have this, and I, I do mean this, we have an incredible investment ecosystem. We don't have a CIO. We have an, in this 600 um, person investment ecosystem that, co that collaborates, that shares ideas, that where different perspectives, different opinions on the same subject are welcome and thrive. If we can continue to do that, and that's, that, that's the input, like can we do that, then hopefully our output over time will generate those returns. Private assets and alternatives yeah. are still a small piece yeah. of Wellington's $1.2 yeah. trillion dollars in, in AUM. How do you grow those parts of the business yeah. when the competitors are large, established, and in many cases, excellent at what they do? We first went into the privates business in 2014, and so our first fund, our first first group of fund, is now on its fourth fund. So we that was the uh, the growth equity initiative. Yeah. So we have we have four. By the end of this year, we're going to have four platforms: growth equity, biotech, climate technology, and investing in diverse founders. So where else can we go? So that's the question. Like where else are where what are our ambitions? Yeah. Where else does it oh, make else sense can to have go? a footprint? We have a very large public footprint and credit. So there are areas that we should play on the private side and credit. To be successful, we don't have to be, it's not about being number one or number two, it's about growing that part of the business and, and generating great results for clients that help, that help the overall business. Um, the same is true on, um, on real estate. So we have a very strong structured debt um, capabilities as well as um, real estate equity capabilities. So can we, attract talent to help us complement those on the public side. You know, longer term, we, sh we, have, we, have a, a, we have 
uh, one hybrid fund. You know, you could envision us having hybrid funds by sector that could, that, like, that's like a natural extension. So we have such strong sector teams. So those assets are what right now? Those assets, Altogether. by the end of the year, they should be seven or eight billion. So a small part, um, but still a, a, an important part of the business. That, that's that's privates and alternatives. Privates and alternatives are seven to eight. The liquid alternatives. We've been in the, we've been in the long short business since 1994, mm -hmm. and that that business is approximately 30 billion. Okay. So, so put them together, and you're getting close to 40. Yes. Yes. Well, I'll repeat what you just said. Which is a small part of of 1.2 trillion dollars. Where should it be? You know, if you're successful, yeah. the CEO, you know, yeah. cast your eyes out into the future and say, well, you know, if we do everything right, we should be at X by when. Yeah, so like if you you could say, if you look at the privates business, and if we're seven or eight in the way privates funds work, you continue to add funds if they're successful, you know, that could easily be a, a $20 billion business if we add these new capabilities over time. Um, or maybe by the end of my end of my tenure as CEO. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, <laughs> I guess for my colleagues in the private business, I've, I've put something out there. But you could, you could make the math work that, that if we continue to do well in those franchises. And on the liquid, on the, on the liquid long shore, we haven't really talked about this yet, but we have, as I said, we've been in this business since 1994. We have a very good business. What we're trying to do is be a destination of choice for long short investors. So earlier this year, we did our first lift out of a team. Mm. Um, that was a five person team. We've never at Wellington done a lift out. This was, this made sense. And then as we do that, we should be able to um, build products out of those, you know, build, build um, strategies, multi-strat products out of those Oh, out of those different funds. So that would be the goal and the ambition. We're doing some of that already, but m more to come there. Could we build market neutral, uh, more market neutral funds? Could we build market neutral sector funds or could we build a whole group of sector funds? So does that mean a $30 billion business becomes a, a $60 billion business? Yeah, you're not gonna pin me down on this. <laughs> <laughs> all, the, all I'm focused on is building capabilities. So how do, we, how do we have a great leader? How do we continue to invest in sort of the, the technology that makes them great investors and, and I think will attract investors. But you are saying to that point, if you're a long short investor or you're a long short team yeah. and you wanna be part of a partnership culture, yeah. they should pick up the phone and give you a ring? Yes. Yes. Gene, there aren't many people in your position who started out yeah. as administrative assistants yeah. and rose to become CEO at the same company, really the only place you've yeah. ever worked. Yes. Tell me your story. So I'll go back to college. So first of all, I, uh, my parents were Irish immigrants. My mother um, raised six kids and my father was a bricklayer. So I didn't know anything about the stock market. <laughs> we didn't talk about stocks around the kitchen table at my house. But I, w I would say they were very focused on education. And so I um, got practically a full scholarship to Wellesley College, um, which was an amazing experience. Um, and, and as one of, those cl one of the classes I took, which was in my junior year, it was wor sociology, it was a sociology class that you had to get a job. Every college has a class you have to take. This was the class you had to take, but I just happened to get a job at a brokerage firm in Boston. And so that was my first introduction to the stock market. And I did not like the cold calling part of the business, um, but I was just fascinated by the stock market. And that's how I found my way um, to Wellington. And Wellington was just beginning to expand. They were hire, hiring college graduates as administrative assistants. So, so at what story. point did you start to manage money? Yeah. And at what point did you realize that this firm was interested in cultivating you as a leader? So I started managing money in 1997. And so in every year from then, I began to manage more money. In 1999, I, I was able to run a biotech portfolio. And in 2000, I was able to run a sleeve of the Hartford Healthcare Fund. And then the decade of the 2000s was really like honing those research, those um, portfolio management skills. I will say I began my leadership journey um, right around the time I moved to London. So I moved my family to London in 2007 and 2008 as we began to globalize our investment platform. It was really about culture. It was also 
um, becoming more independent from my cocoon here in Boston. I'm from a very large family, a big Irish family. I had, I had my, my, my life was planned out. I had social events all the time, barbecues here. So I actually do think moving to London, being alone with my small family unit, being away from the person I worked with for 16, 17 years, was the beginning of my leadership journey. And then I became managing partner in 2014. You're still running the world's largest healthcare fund. Yes. How is that possible? <laughs> it's like managing $46 billion yeah. dollars with all the research and yeah. all the analysis that it takes to stay on top of such a complex industry, yeah. set of industries really, while also being the CEO, yeah. and while also being, I hasten to add, a mom to four daughters. How do you yeah. do that? So uh, everyone has um, super strengths, right? Everyone, everyone, everyone has super strengths. One of my super strengths is... Your superpower. A superpower is organization. If I wasn't as organized and, and sort of a superpower and processes, I think it would be, it would probably be impossible. Biotech in particular yeah. has been hammered yeah. in the stock sell-off. Sitting here today, in which companies or technologies or concepts do you have the most conviction yeah. as an investor? So the most conviction I have is that we are going through a biology revolution. So we are, this is like the most exciting time of science in my, in my almost 30 years of following biotech. And, and what, what I mean by that is, you know, the, the human genome was sequenced in the year 2000. Um, we didn't, we didn't even, the industry didn't even have machines to, to do it, to do experiments till 2010. And it's really only been the last five years that they've had machines, sequencers, and um, a cost base to do it, meaning that they're under $1,000, that they've been able to do deep experimentation. And what, what do you get from deep experimentation? What you get is um, just a greater understanding of biological pathways, uh, so higher confidence that this is the target. Um, so the, I think we're on the early stages of the industry knowing this, this target causes this disease. And so will we see, I think there's early signs that you're seeing an increase in R&D productivity, which makes perfect sense to me. So that would be number one. Um, number two is if you look at the whole history of medicine, you, you, you had for, until the 1990s, you had oral drugs. So your aspirins or your Advils, those, those would go after targets in the body, such as enzymes, such as receptors that were small. The big breakthroughs in the 90s were um, biologics. You probably have heard mm -hmm. that term. And those sure. would both be proteins, like take, you know, copying proteins that are in the body or using something called a monoclonal antibody. Those both go after large receptors in the bo of biology, large receptors in the body. In 2022, we have all of those, but we also have um, gene therapy. We also have technologies like mRNA that we've seen with the vaccines. We have something called small interfering RNA that's a platform to go after you know, hundreds of potential targets. Um, you potentially have gene editing. It's not, it's not, it hasn't been proven yet, but you potentially have gene editing. You have not only monoclonal antibodies, but you have bispecific antibodies going after two antibodies at a time. You have a technology that goes after called antibody drug conjugates where you, you know, attach like a toxin to an antibody and that's like potentially could over time replace a lot of chemotherapy. So what I'm most confident in is that they have, you have these platforms in in tools to go after the biology that didn't exist 10 years ago. So you combine both of those and it's going to be, you know, the next 20, 30 years is we're just going to have tremendous benefits to the world in terms of understanding biology and having products that will change mortality and morbidity of disease. Harder or easier to find the winners? Even for me as a, you know, someone who's been doing this for 30 years, like how do you keep track of five or 600 companies? So, you know, we, we have a larger team than we did five years ago because of that in terms of the number of biotech analysts we have. So we're just trying to make sure we, we are covering it. But I, I would say if you are a generalist portfolio manager, I think it's much more complex, even though the science is better. We've talked about the virtues of being a private partnership. 
Have you ever wondered to yourself if Wellington would be better off as a public company? No. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> because I've, I've followed public companies my whole career, and for a lot of public companies, you have to really focus on um, short, and they really, really, the public markets really force you to be more short-term focused. And it's more short-term focused than it was 15 or 20 years ago. And the best companies continue to operate with a, a long-term focus. Our private partnership just allows us to be long-term focused. The other question you would ask, what would ever make us go public? And it would probably be some dramatic change in the industry where we need a capital in a way we don't need today. This company makes a lot of money, doesn't it? We are in the asset management business, and if we do well and we generate um, alpha for our clients, it is a profitable business. I was fishing for something a little bit different, which is along the lines of this. There aren't many publicly traded companies yeah. with assets under management in the neighborhood of Wellington's. Only a handful. Yeah. But they make, you know, those with a one handle on the trillions make somewhere between one and three billion dollars a year in net income. Is that ballpark for Wellington too? Uh, you're not going to get me there, Eric. <laughs> 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 it's a nice try. All, all I'll say is that we are, we participate in the asset management industry. Um, we have a, you know, a similar, similar cost, but we, we're, not diff we're not the same as everyone else. We don't have the cost, we, we, are, we are an investment management business, so we earn a fee for managing the money. We're not, we're not a heavily distribution oriented business. All of our compensation though is geared towards performance. So. Everyone at Wellington will do better if we perform for clients, and that's the key. How do you decide who gets paid what? So that's, that's the other part of our um, partnership, the three managing partners, um, which I've been one since 2014, um, distribute or determine the profit, how the profits are split at the firm. So you have to imagine there has to be tremendous trust in the three managing partners, and that trust means I know they trust us to know what's going on in the business, who's having impact, that we're not going to play favorites, that we're going to be really fair. The path to partnership and the ability to become a partner at Wellington is a really critical part of our um, ability to attract talent. Talent has always been one of the hardest, yeah. maybe the hardest problem to solve for in the investment business. And that was true before the yeah. pandemic, right? And the demands that yeah. it has created for flexibility and the demands that it has created for diversity, how hard is the talent problem now? I think the pandemic has shown us, and it probably should show most companies, that it's not about buildings. It's about the culture, it's about shared values. In the future, we're gonna be more flexible about where our talent sits. How much of Wellington's success in the future depends on how well you integrate technology? I think five years from now, we won't have a technology department. We'll have, technologists will be integrated into running the business. And I'll give you some examples. We have portfolio construction tools. We have ways to screen. Each portfolio manager has a philosophy and process, and they have a, a tool that helps them screen based on that philosophy and process. We have these tools now that are bring very qualitative things into a, a quantitative framework. We have our own internal risk portal. So we ha how, how do you continue to make that a greater and greater, and we already talked about ESG and how much it's data oriented. How do you make that more and more part of the portfolio construction process? If we're, if we're in a more complex world, which I do believe we are in, a more complex investing world, where it's not just about revenues and earnings and PE, it's about a, this mosaic of things that are gonna impact the value of a company or the value of that return, like what's the path of portfolio returns, technology is going to play a bigger and bigger part of that. There are a lot of asset managers. Yeah. Who do you think of as Wellington's main competition? Well, I will say I've talked to quite a number of them in, in my new role as CEO, and I have a lot of respect for my peers. One observation would be that they're all a little bit different. Right? Sure. They're all a little bit different. But if you, look, if you look at over time, who has sort of a research process that's similar to us? Like I would say Capital Group, mm -hmm. um, T. Rowe Price. I'm often in meetings with Capital and T. Rowe Price. You know, PIMCO on the fixed income side is probably a competitor that we highly respect and, and um, 
and run into from a client perspective. Those would be a few examples. And, and then on the private side, it's the, it's, um, it would be you know, many, many small firms. And on the long, short side. Name three things you admire at rival firms and wish Wellington could do as well. All right, well this is, um, okay, give me a minute to think about this. I, I think that um, if you look at BlackRock, they, have, they use their technology um, as an advantage to interact with clients. Um, I don't think anyone really in that, in that way can compete with them um, in terms of the competition with Aladdin. I think that, that is just very impressive. Capital Group and their and their um, their their distribution in the U.S., for example, that they have a real they have a very strong relationship with broker dealers um, in the U.S. I think that's also very impressive. If you look at some private firms, this is not so much direct competitors, but firms that have been around for 20 years. I think it's a real advantage if you've been on the private side, if you just have re if you've been around for quite a long period of time. So. Obviously, firms like Sequoia, we're, they're not doing exactly what we're doing, but they just have sort of this, you know, I, I'm studying them quite a bit just because we are, you know, how do we get, how do we be excellent in the private business? And there's a few of them that have just done such a good job consistently over time. Um, that's been very impressive. Is growing this business important to you and to your fellow partners? You know, we follow 5,000 companies. We're, we're we're always analyzing how are companies relative to their relative to their competition and their peers. So we want to we want to win, right? So we want to do well. Um, I'm also a strong believer in you can't aspire to grow just for growth's sake. You ha you have to be super focused on the inputs. And if you do really well on the inputs, you will grow as a firm. The leadership team, I think our partnership is very focused on that. Like if we have the right inputs, and that means are we investing in talent? Are we investing in new capabilities? Are we um, expanding in areas that we think will help our clients? Then hopefully we will, gr and we can deliver performance, we will grow. Let's talk about the legacy that you're in the process of defining. When your colleagues and your clients yeah. look back on the Jeans Heinz era yeah. as CEO, they'll say you accomplished what? That we've continued to hire amazing talent. We have made our collaborative um, investment ecosystem stronger and that we, we have been a firm that's growing so we've been able to expand the partnership and that we are delivering, most importantly, we're delivering great outcomes to clients. And maybe finally, it's like to, like, it's more about like, can I do what the previous CEOs have done and figure out ways to strengthen Wellington so that it's that it, we have another 40, 50 years that the, the next set of CEOs can continue that this is a you know, this is a I'm just passing through and a steward of this firm that, you know, my almost 40 years here, whatever, whatever I retire that that I will know with, um, you know, know that this, will, this firm will be very strong for the next 50 years. Gene, thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. I really, really enjoyed our time. <laughs>